Welcome to the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Institute, a nonprofit organization dedicated to furthering both education and research in the field of oral implantology. My name is Dr. Waji Khan. I'm a dental surgeon and also the course director for a series of online lectures provided as a service to the profession of dentistry to deliver a literature and knowledge-based approach to dental implant education for practitioners interested in learning more about how to implement the discipline of oral implantology into their clinical practice. This online course should be merged with a suitable clinical course and long-term mentorship study club program so that the learner can maximize their benefit from the didactic online program. The production of this series of lectures was partially funded by an educational grant from the International Dental Implant Academy. Lecture 16, Literature Review. So the purpose of this lecture basically is to talk about things like evidence-based implant treatment. Basically there are a multitude of materials, implants, components, and surgical and prosthodontic techniques available for the surgeon. Not all are well documented or successful in that regard. There is an, both an ethical and medical legal obligation on the part of the clinician to base their treatment decisions and recommendations for patients upon the best current available evidence. And in this light, in order to do so, an up-to-date knowledge base and critical appraisal of the current evidence is essential. So I realize that even this lecture is going to become an artifact in time, and basically what we'd like to do in this presentation is empower or tool uh, the student learner in terms of how they can critically analyze available evidence. So in terms of appraisal of evidence, what is the strength and quality of available research to either support a particular uh, product or a particular technique or method? Are the results of research both valid and reliable? And are the valid results clinically important? What is the clinical significance of a particular thing? Does it actually make a difference or are you just adding a cost or a, uh, a procedure, uh, in, you know, uh, putting the uh, patient through uh, the morbidity uh, of having to go through a particular thing in order to uh, achieve something which somebody claims? And lastly, can these valid and important results be applied to my patients? So is it gonna make a difference from the patient's perspective in terms of outcome? There are many leading implant systems out there, and of the leading implant systems, we talk about eight, uh, eight sorts of things. So we talk about scientifically proven research that has been used. We talk about evidence-based clinical use. Number three, we talk about animal experiments for these implant systems. Number four, has there been some sort of valid, controlled, prospective studies conducted on the use of these implants and many times it's the implants and the innovations or it's sort of some of the uh, marketing tidbits that they offer you. Number five, has there been multi-centered clinical trials? So has there been trials conducted in various different hands and various different sets of minds? Number six, has there been some type of long-term documentation of the predictability of this type of implant system? Number seven, has there been continuous research and development with backward compatibility with previous implant systems? And lastly, number eight, most leading implant manufacturers provide excellent clinical and technical backup and support along with some sort of product training. So with time, there have been many modifications that have been introduced to implant design. We talked about this in lecture one, and these can improve long-term success in select cases. Uh, today, there are over 1,300 different types of dental implants which are available, and these vary in terms of material, shape, sizes, lengths, and surface coatings and a variety of these other uh, uh, things that sort of you know make one implant different from the other are these really things that are going to be key point clinically significant for you and your patient or are they just marketing tools so comparing implants can be can be difficult in many ways so a lot of times I'll speak with colleagues at different uh, conventions and different meetings and sometimes on the golf course and we'll be talking about different types of implant systems and uh, different types of cases and the problem with comparing implants which makes it difficult is that there's a lack of well-conducted randomized clinical trials with long-term follow-up for many of the products that are out on the market. There are only a very few comparative studies investigating the survival or success of different types of implant systems. There's also a lack of universally used success criteria 
Uh, different studies use different criteria, which makes comparison very, very difficult. This affects the homogeneity of trials when carrying out systematic reviews. As well, uh, number four, there are different studies which use different outcome measures. Uh, often these are not specified in the publications, making it almost impossible to compare the results of different trials. And lastly, there's a lack of studies with long-term five to ten year follow-up. So in terms of the types of papers or the types of uh, things that we would recommend that one look at, you need to look for well-designed longitudinal clinical studies that demonstrate the efficacy and effectiveness of methods and biocompatibility of materials. So there have been some good papers that have been published out there. Uh, Dr. Brandemark in the, in the 1982 uh, Toronto conference was able to really uh, lay the groundwork for what it would become uh, a, 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 a symposium that would be held 20 years later looking at the results of his work and we really have to thank him for uh, for, for uh, you know pioneering uh, implant dentistry however uh, when it comes to future studies and future papers uh, I would encourage students to basically take a look at the papers and using some of these criteria that we discussed uh, inside this presentation take a look at them and sort of you know maybe take things with a grain of salt if it seems like it's more marketing or more uh, packaging than it is actually reality you have to sort of uh, you have to sort of call it out for being what it is so in terms of papers that i would recommend that students do uh, take a look at number 1 would be the 1983 paper by the Dr. Erickson and Dr. Albertson which was on temperature threshold levels for heat induced bone tissue injury which was a vital microscopy study in the rabbit and the reason this is important is because even to this date there's some orthopedic surgeons out there that drill bone and do not irrigate which is kind of weird so you need to realize that when we are placing implants one of the very most important things we do is that we don't traumatize the bone the next paper we go to is a paper by Albertson, Zarb, Worthington, and Erickson in 1986. And this was the long-term efficacy of currently used dental implants, a review and proposed criteria for success. Uh, the reason this paper is a good one to read is because it really sort of deferred from the 1978 Harvard criteria with respect to how to define success for implants. I mean, there's going to be another paper I'm going to refer to you a little bit later, but moving forward a paper I really enjoyed reading was by Tatum it was on maxillary and sinus implant reconstruction uh, published in 1986 this is basically the groundwork for uh, a lot of the sinus lifts that we do today we have Dr. Tatum to thank for that uh, this is the next paper I'm going at here in 2008 by Mish et al I'll say sorry for the guys who I'm categorizing as al uh, in terms of implant success survival and failure so this really builds upon that Harvard 1978 and that Zarb 1986 uh, paper and this was published uh, in the uh, implant dentistry through the International Congress of Oral Implantologists and then a uh, final few bunch of papers here is a paper by Shin which is called implant failure associated with oral bisphosphonate related osteonecrosis of the jaw uh, a paper by Al Farji which in which he discussed basically surgical complications in oral implantology etiology prevention and management and then lastly a paper published by Tagliareni uh, in 2015 in which he discussed basic concepts and techniques of dental implants so the next lecture we have lecture 17 is the interpretation basics of cone beam CT like all of the presentations that we've had in this lecture series, I've included all of the references uh, which we referred to in the, uh, in the formulation of this lecture series. And on behalf of the entire dental treatment team at the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Institute, I want to thank you to listen, for listening to this lecture.